Hello everybody, welcome ladies and gentlemen to episode 4. Right, today I'm going to do a quicker video, I'm just going to skim through a couple of things. First of all, as always, thank you everyone for watching these videos, I appreciate the sheer number of comments and real positive interactions I got on my last video, episode 3, where I was talking about uh, rock lead guitar and the importance of double tone bends and it really opened up a wider discussion that I wasn't exactly prepared for in fact which was just people talking about kind of so many different players that are known for their fantastic bending technique of course you know that was just a general kind of idea I was throwing out there about the double tone bend but it really opened up as I say a lot of players that I hadn't really thought about how significantly impactful they were on me as a player guys like Brian May someone noted really well known for his bends and it's something that I've realized again I implement a lot into my own playing and uh, there's a real signature kind of flourish to a Brian May bend that I often just overlook because it's so kind of ingrained in me that gorgeous real slow slurry up usually just a single tone bend that Brian May would do but something like <laughs> good one thanks for pointing that out uh, about Brian May obviously Gilmore as well um, I have to say and I'm not really gonna I don't think I'm pre prepared for how much um, controversy this might cause among the comments I don't know but I'm not the biggest Gilmore fan in the world I totally appreciate what he's about and everything that he, he stands for and I can understand why so many people are really into Gilmore's playing I'm not against his playing at all um, but it's just never really grabbed me in the way that I think it's grabbed a lot of players maybe it will happen to me at some point, uh, but as of right now, you know, I totally understand why people revere Gilmore so much, but he's just not really, he's not the guy for me. He doesn't, uh, doesn't excite the molecules in my guitar playing brain. I don't know. Maybe that'll change, but anyway, um, I love The Wall, by the way. I'll talk about The Wall in future episodes, because that's one of my favourite, favourite guitar albums, but um, that's a totally separate issue. Anyway, I just wanted to put that to bed, because some really great reactions to that last video, so thank you guys for that keep the reactions coming because as I said in my introduction to this channel that's kind of what I'm going to thrive on going forwards with these videos I want it to be reactive so thank you very much um, question for today that I want to address briefly is um, a question from Mr. Raul Garcia um, on my last video he said you have lots of amplifiers if you could only just choose one which would it be huge question of course so I, I thought quite carefully about this, but the more I thought about it, the more I realised that my immediate answer was going to be my final one. And it's the amplifier that I'm playing through right now, um, the Sir Badger 35. A lot of people will know at the moment that I'm having a bit of a love affair with my brand new Boogie Fillmore 50, which is an incredible amplifier and I'm really enjoying exploring it, learning about what it's got to offer. I had a great little play on it this morning, uh, nice and loud, and it really works for what I wanted it to work for. But as I said when I unveiled that amp in a couple of videos ago, my heart and my home really is in Brit style amps. It's what I've known and loved for, for years. Um, pretty much everything else in this on the, on the shelves behind me is Brit inspired. The Badger is the amp that I've had for the longest. I'm not going to delve deeply into it today because if you want to find out more about this amp and the reason why I'd say it's my favourite, you can check out the video review that I've already filmed of this amp. Um, coming up a couple of years ago I think that was um, now but yeah go back on my channel check that out I really went in depth with it it excels at clean tones it excels at mid gain breakup tones which is actually what I'm using it for today and you can push the gain and get some really nice high gain sounds as well but to me with it being an EL84 amp and the power scaling there's just kind of no limit to the infinite little variables that you can get out of the gain structuring of it, the way that you can manipulate the EQ. It differs from a lot of other Brit style amplifiers in that regard and that it's not just like you plug it in and it's got a sound. It's actually very much a chameleon type amplifier. And uh, let me just turn the overdrive pedal off because the tone I had there was with a full tone OCD. 
here's just the tone of the amp with this exotic um, XTC1 guitar. Here's just the, you know, kind of dial it in, gain about halfway. <laughs> So I love that tone because it's got that kind of Vox AC kind of thing, but with just a couple of quick uh, knob twiddles, which I'll demonstrate, if I up the mid-range and the gain a little bit more and bring down the power, now it turns into a more of a martial type of... <laughs> Okay, so I just love this amp. I mean, that's a very brief little demo there. As I say, if you want to hear it properly, everything this amp's capable of, check out the video review I've already done. I'll link it down in the description below as well. Uh, I'm just going to skim that back to where it was roughly because I really liked the sound I had dialed in there um, with the OCD as well. But hopefully that answers your question, Raoul. I'd still say, as of 2020, when I'm filming this video, the Badger 35 would probably be the last amp that I would ever get rid of. However, it did kind of make me think about a broader question, which is not just which amp in particular, but what kind of amp. And as I said, I kind of answered that as well. Pretty much any of the amps that I now have, I could quite comfortably say that could be my only amp. Between the Badger, the, the Fillmore, of course, and then I've got a couple of Zs up here, which I'm going to talk about in future videos, the Remedy and the Route 66. They're all in a similar kind of a vein. They're all Brit voiced. They're all between like 30 and 50 watts. But they have a couple of significant differences between them, like different output tubes, different front end voicings. So despite deceptively being quite um, closely aligned with one another, they are all different, but I can pretty much cover anything I want to do with this style of amplifier. So I think that's something to think about as well. Not just a particular amp, but what sort of family of amp do you tend to go for? I want to know as well what you guys think. Leave me a comment below with what's your favorite family of amplifier. I think we, te we tend to just group them all together, you know, you've got your Fenders, your Vox and your Marshall style amps. That's a very lazy categorization, I think, usually, because amps obviously have entirely unique voicings. Amplifiers are my, my heart and soul, really. I love guitars and I love pedals, but amps are really where I get most enjoyment out of the intricacies between them. So that's why most of my amps are very similar, but they're all different at the same time. So anyway, let me know in the comments what you think about that. The last thing I want to talk about today is um, something I'm going to do going forward as well. I've talked in, the, in previous videos about players that have influenced me, and they're guys that I think most, most people will often have in their top list of players, whether it's Lukather, Beck, Clapton, Ace Freely to a degree as well, I've talked about a little. However, I want to kind of pay a little bit of attention to players that I think are massively underrated. So some of the players that don't get talked about in the same breath uh, in the same breath as those other players I just talked about and that you don't necessarily think about on a day-to-day -day basis but actually have hugely kind of transformed the way that I personally have perceived music throughout the course of my life. So the player I want to just quickly give a nod to today and the reason I picked a Telecaster and I think an appropriately matching t-shirt um, to is Francis Rossi. When I was growing up, um, when I was very young in fact, and I just started to play guitar, so around the age of eight or nine, um, and I'm going to come onto this in later videos when I talk about kind of my backstory and how I got into music in the first place, but Status Quo was such a huge, hugely influential band for me, um, and it was some of my earliest memories of music. I was playing music with my cousins in little bands, and a lot of the stuff we played was Stones and Quo, and all that kind of stuff, and Quo really stuck with me, and they really resonated, and as I've got older and progressed more as a, as a player, obviously your initial impression of status quo, and I think what most people perceive them as, is that band that goes... not what they're about. They do that a lot and that's what they were well known for, the kind of rock boogie stuff. And I think chances are if you listen to a lot of my Peach demos, especially if I play a Telecaster or something, that's my go-to because it's such an instantly uh, recognizable sound and it's something that really 
I think emotes with a lot of people. But that aside, you know, that is a reason that Quo were great. But Francis Rossi in particular, as I as I was saying, as I've evolved as a player, his melodic sensibility is something that I think really is under undervalued and it made Quo such an accessible band. Obviously Rick Parfit was amazing as well and I was very fortunate I got to see them just before Rick died uh, a few years ago. It was on their acoustic tour um, and it was thanks to my friend Elliot that I got to go and see that gig which I really appreciate and it was a special memory for me because they were such a meaningful band. It wasn't the electric set but that didn't matter, it was Quo still. and um, So Rick Parfit was great but Francis Rossi and his lead voicings, you know, as an example, they had a track called uh, 4500 Times, which if you haven't heard that and you're, cu and you're curious as to why the hell I'm talking about status quo, listen to that song because it's such a dynamic little piece. It starts with some clean guitar from Rick Parfit, just with him singing, and then it kicks into the, the main song, which is really groovy, and it does a kind of Midnight Rambler-esque transition between a a slow ploddy groove into a faster thing in the middle as well. Great track, but one of my favourite little lines from, from Rossi, he plays something like this. There's just a very simple... That type of thing. And Rossi comes in with this. kind of a groove so it's stuff like that and they're just they're so much of a better band than they get credit for and Rossi I think as the kind of perpetrator of those lead guitar lines influenced amazing riffs like <laughs> riff on old quo but just you know as an aside there just I think listen to some quo listen to some old Francis Rossi and the stuff he was doing in the 70s he had a great tone playing that green telly I think it was mostly Voxes and AC30s and maybe old Marshalls and stuff they used at that time he just had that really nice stinging telly tone and it worked so well really resonated with me and it still does to be honest so yeah I just wanted to give a bit of love to Quo and to Mr Rossi and in the future I'll do more videos talking about players that I think are um, devastatingly underrated but if you've got guys that you think uh, are underrated players as well and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, female guitar players as well in fact I will talk about some in the future but just leave them in the comments because I want to know who you think are underrated um, you hear so much talk about players are overrated and whatever and they don't like this player don't like that player shut up who cares? Overrated players, there's no such thing, you know, they're great because they're great. It's the same reason people call status quo dad rock, I mean, what's wrong with that? Dads are usually older and wiser and they prefer quality over quantity and that's what Quo represents. So, that's my little uh, my little rant on Quo, got a little bit aggressive there. Um, anyway, so yeah, none of that overrated player stuff, I want to hear who you think are some of the most underrated players of all time. Let's give those guys some respect. So anyway, thank you for listening to me rant and ramble today. Um, I said this was going to be a quicker video and it certainly hasn't turned out to be, but I appreciate you watching this far. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like down below, comment with your thoughts and all the stuff I talked about as well. Keep those questions coming in. Subscribe if you haven't already. I appreciate everybody that has. Stay tuned, I'm going to be putting out more stuff very soon. So take care of yourselves. Thank you very much for watching. 
I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.